I'd like to introduce uh, Akshay Venkatesh, or reintroduce Akshay for his uh, last talk and also the closing talk of the school. Uh, Braden, this is still. Oh, yeah, sorry. All right. Already how to do this. So, in this, well, what did you call it? The spirit of experimentation. I've come prepared. All right. <laughs> Perfect. But it turns out these are expensive, so I only got one. Okay. Um, so last time, what we are trying to do is understand or, or uh, see this fairy tale where looking at automorphic forms through the lens or with the help of this uh, TQFT as a metaphor. So I'm going to tell you a little more about TQFT, and then we go, we're going to go back to automorphic forms. I thought I would say at the start, though, that... Uh, yeah, just let me know if, if you can't see this. Um, you know, this is not the, f the, uh, the first influence of physics on our subject. As Wheatex said, you know, the origin of a lot of representation theory really was quantum mechanics. Okay, so we've, done, we've seen the Heisenberg parabolic, the uh, Heisenberg group, and so on. Actually, it's an interesting fact, which may maybe contrasts to how it is now. So Heisenberg in the 1920s, he was doing whatever, computing some probabilities of electrons to go from here to here. And he had these, so he had these arrays of numbers. And he went and he had some complicated way to manipulate them. And he showed it to Born. And Born thought for a weekend. And then he remembered that in his undergraduate math classes, he had learned an arcane thing called matrix multiplication. I'm not kidding. Heisenberg did not know about matrix multiplication. So that you may find that inspiring or discouraging, <laughs> according to your point of view. Anyway, the history of the interaction of the, you know, the subject has a long history of interaction with physics. OK, so let, I'm just going to uh, briefly summarize what uh, TQFT4 is. And I, I don't have time to do this justice. You can l look in a TS paper, section two, where it's beautifully presented. OK, I'm not even going to, s the, the number of points I have to gloss over. But basically, what this is, it takes in a, a smooth oriented, OK, so I'm going to be sloppy about orientations in this talk, but it is important, oriented three manifold and spits out a vector space. Now, if you take the union of two things, and here's where it's essentially different from something like homology, you get the, the, the answer is tensor, OK? And remember, this is one of the ways in which I motivated um, coming to this, because that's similar to what we see in the theory of automorphic form. I'll come back to that. And the other thing is, the, to get a, the functoriality is for bordism. So this is what a bordism looks like. M and N are three manifolds. This guy here is a four manifold. So often in this talk, because I can't draw, I'll just write the number meaning the dimension. So this thing in the middle is a four manifold. These guys are three manifolds. And that gives you a map, a bordism from M to N, that is a four manifold with boundary M union N, gives you a map from, from the vector space for M to the vector space for N. Uh, and regarding you know, which one is it from and which one to, that has to do with orientations, which we're being a bit sloppy about. Now, you may wonder why this is called, it's called TQFT4, okay, or four-dimensional. And the reason is that there's a, a point of view which I think would be much closer to what a physicist might take, that if you have such a thing, it gives you an invariant, and just a numerical invariant of a four-manifold. Okay, so, it is, it's a vec so three manifolds get assigned vector spaces, but four manifolds just get numbers. Uh, let me just explain how that works. It comes out of the structure. It's not an additional thing. So given, let's start first with this. Given a four-manifold Z with boundary M, you can think of this as a cobordism from the empty three-manifold. OK, it's kind of the empty three-manifold over here. It's a bordism from that empty manifold to M. Now, this A, the axioms for a force, it, it, there's some non-degeneracy which forces uh, 
the empty manifold to be assigned the complex numbers. Well, everything here should, let's say, it's over C. Okay, it doesn't have to be, but let's say. So what this gives you is really a, it gives you a linear map from the complex numbers to the vector space for M. In other words, a vector in AM. Okay, so if you have a four manifold with boundary, it gives you a vector in AM. If you have a four manifold without boundary, it gives you a vector in the complex numbers because, so to speak, it's the previous situation with M empty. And that's a complex number. Okay, so you can think of, the, and I think this would be, as I said, the point of view a physics, physicist might take. This is a, as a way to get invariants of four manifolds, but these invariants have a spe, invariant just mean numbers, but they have a special type of property, which is that they're amenable to cut and paste decomposition. Okay, so imagine this is now a four manifold that I've drawn here, and I cut it in two. All right. So I now have two halves, each with boundary the same three manifold. And then the way you can compute the numerical invariant is like this. And this is, again, just a consequence of the axioms, which I, I haven't um, stated all of them. But the, the, you, the left half of this picture, if you just look at the left half, it gives you a vector in A sub M. That's what I just said. If you look at the right half of the picture and are careful about orientations, it gives you a vector in the dual vector space and you just pair them to get a number. Now, for a four manifold, you can do this in many different ways. And the point is they all give the same answer. Okay, so, so it's not just any numerical, it's not any system of numerical invariants of four manifolds that can arise this way. It's very special ones that are um, amenable to being thus decomposed. So I, I'm just gonna give you a quick example. That point of, this example is not at all relevant to the type of thing we wanna do, but it's just to, um, convince you that this, this concept is not sort of some, uh, some kind of devilry from the underworld. Um, so, it, so this is a very, just meant to be a very concrete example of a TQFT, but I've gone down, I've reduced the dimension so I can be completely concrete. Okay, so the four has been replaced by a two, which means all the dimensions on the left-hand side get reduced by two. So this is a very simple, uh, this is a uh, kind of minimal case of a, toy model proposed by Digraph and Witten. So you fix a finite group G. Now, since I've gone two dimensions down, I should assign one manifold vector spaces. And so one manifold, just a bunch of circles. The circle is assigned the vector space of class functions on G. Okay, that is functions that are conjugacy invariant. Finite dimensional vector space. This picture is a bordism between the union of two circles and one circle. So it should give you a map from class functions, tensor class functions to class functions, and that function, uh, uh, well, I've, I've said this wrong, sorry, this should be the, the, uh, the group algebra, sorry. The, uh, I should say not class functions, but the group algebra, sorry. The conjugacy invariance functions in the group algebra. Uh, so CG conjugacy invariant. Well, I guess, that's, sorry, I, I want to convolve them. So the, um, the, uh, the um, linear map for this is from this uh, space, tensor the space to itself, and you just, you just multiply. That is, you use multiplication in the group algebra. That's why I said it is the group algebra. And then, um, just as in the general case, this gives a numerical invariant in two dimensions. And what that does, it assigns to a genus G surface this number. It essentially the number of ways to write the identity element of the group as a product of G commutators. Okay, so you can read about that. You can look up the digraph written uh, model. It's, but it's just there to convince you that this, this thing is not, um, it can be, there are explicit examples that are very nice and uh, simple to compute with. Now, we're gonna need something a little bit more for our discussion, which is extended. Okay, so we can now ask, so going back to this TQFT4, we can ask to, for a cut and paste decomposition of, so, uh, of what happens for three manifolds. That is just as I wrote here a picture for cutting up four manifolds, so okay, Here's what I have so far, okay? Uh, this regular TQFT already gives you 
something away to assign four manifolds, get assigned complex numbers, and three manifolds, without boundary here, get assigned vector spaces. Now, you can now ask for extra data, which allows you to compute for three manifolds by cutting and pasting. And what that extra data is, so this is going to be an informal discussion. There's a completely precise mathematical definition, but it's complicated. But the basic idea is if you want to be able to draw, uh, do things like this for uh, three manifolds, you're going to assign two manifolds to categories. And more precisely, categories where the morphism spaces are vector spaces, linear categories. Okay, so categories with, where the homs are vector spaces. Uh, and the point is, the point of doing this is we should be able to have exactly the same picture as over here, but one dimension lower. Okay, so now, uh, so, so uh, uh, when I have a, suppose I have now a three manifold, uh, which I'll consistently try to call M, and its boundary is a two manifold, which I'll call S or surface, this gives you, just like the picture one dimension up, you got a vector in the vector space, now you get an object in the category. An object in the category for S, that, let's call this, let, let's call this A sub S, the category that, and if you glue two things, and, uh, sorry, I'm running out of space here, but if I glue two things, the vector space, so these are again, this is a three manifold, and the vector space that it's assigned should be the home from the left thing to the right. Okay, so both the left and the right are now objects in your category. So this substitutes for pairing two vectors. You can pair two vectors and get a number. You can pair two objects in the category by means of taking morphisms from one to the other, and you get a vector space. Okay, so this is the structure that we're, and sorry about that, but this is the structure that we are going to look for uh, in the context of automorphic forms. So you see, the reason we have to do this is we don't, in fact, we don't have any visible four-dimensional objects, but we have plenty of three- and two-dimensional objects. So that is why. Uh, all right, now let's see if I can get that all in the picture. So you can keep it. Uh, sorry. All right, well, the right-hand side is more important than maybe. All right. What did I do? Sorry? Oh, if you can zoom out, that'd be great. Okay, now let me start by, in the tradition of these lectures, by giving a kind of correction to what I said before. But it's, uh, since it's a fairy tale, no mathematical corrections are required. Um, it's rather a correction to the picture. So last time we said that Z, we said that Z, we'll say Z1 over P, has boundary QP, or more precisely, the spectrum, uh, let, let's write it in full glory. The spectrum of this is like a three manifold with boundary QP, which is like a spec QP, which is like a two manifold. Okay, and we, and there was a more precise thing, which I'll remind you of in a second, that you could, you glued in a tube to get back spec Z. But one thing, and, and here, so this we motivated on topological or grounds of Italic homology. One thing that, uh, on the other hand, we've learned in number theory is that all the places of a global field should be put on the same setting. Okay, so Z1 over P, it has kind of two missing places, P and infinity, and I, I haven't included infinity. So I would just like to postulate that the correct statement is that spec Z1 over P actually has two, or let's say, yeah, spec Z1 over P should really have boundary two things, spec R and spec QP, and spec Z has boundary spec R. 
Okay, so our new picture, here's our new picture is of spec Z, is it actually has a boundary, which is the two manifold spec R. This is not something that you can justify in the same way as the previous talk, but it will be the right point of view for us to take for automorphic forms, and I think it's justifiable, in, as I said, in the spirit of what we've learned in number theory about the Archimedean and non-Archimedean places being put on the same footing. Spec Z1 over P, as you'll remember, was obtained from this by deleting this kind of knot for a small tube. Okay, so we, if, I, if I had, I took a small tube around this, this knot, and then when I deleted it, I got a uh, So spec Z1 over P, when I delete that, I get another boundary component, which is spec QP. So, so, uh, so just to draw it schematically, spec Z, once you delete that, you, I'm sorry, this is obviously a slightly different point of view, but spec Z1 over P, now you have two three manifolds as boundary components, which are these guys. Okay, and that's the point of view we're gonna take for, the, for this lecture. Okay, so I, I will put this there eventually. Okay, so now let us try to set up what automorphic forms as a, so as an extended, or think of it. So you'll remember last time there was one thing that we, we said only, okay, here, uh, let me write down for you some three-dimensional and some two-dimensional objects that we discussed last time. Every time I write a ring, I really mean it's spectrum. So Z, Z1 over P, um, let's, I'm gonna call X a smooth projective curve over FP, and ZP, those were some three-dimensional objects that we encountered last time. And then here are some two-dimensional objects that we encountered last time. QP, R has been newly declared a two-dimensional object because it's the boundary of Z. Um, and let's call it X bar, a projective smooth curve over FP bar. Okay, now the, the, the way I motivate getting to to this TQFT point of view was thinking about the theory of automorphic forms. The primary object of study is it assigns to Z or any other uh, similar ring of integers a space of automorphic forms. Okay, again, remember we've, we've fixed a group. Uh, fix a group G, uh, um, let's say SLN. If it's, if, it, if it's not SLN, you have to modify slightly for issues of class number, but so the space of automorphic forms is just functions on GZ mod GR. Okay, if you want a specific space of functions, we can take L2. It, we, we, at the level of resolution we're looking at, that such questions will not be uh, relevant. Okay, so and so these are the examples I discussed last time, and I, I kind of motivated that he, these had pr properties not analogous to cohomology, but analogous to a TQFT, G, GZ1 over P mod, sorry, this is, got, this is GQ, uh, GQ times GR. Okay, those are vector spaces. Now, okay, really, these are vector spaces, these, these guys, Z and Z1 over P are manifolds with boundary Okay, so they're not, they're meant to be assigned something slightly different. We'll come back to that in just one moment. There is at least a natural space of automorphic forms for the projective smooth curve over FP, which is just, as in Zhiwei's talks, functions on the space of G bundles on your curve. Okay, that's just uh, the sub functions on the set of G bundles. ZP, all right, ZP is not obvious what to do. Doesn't really, we don't really talk about automorphic forms on ZP. 
just to remind you, ZP was considered three-dimensional because it was the tube excised around P. Okay, but now let's go to QP for a moment. Well, well, um, so this, these are two-dimensional. All these objects here are two-dimensional. And accordingly, right, if you look over here, they're supposed to be assigned to categories. Now, in the role of a local field, in the, in the Langlands correspondence, is, it shows up in the local Langlands correspondence, and that's what we study are representations of G of QP, okay, which form a category. And they don't certainly don't form a vector space, but they form a category, and so it's, that's the, really, if we're looking for such a, a thing, that's the only thing we can possibly do. Category of G of QP representations and R will go to the category of GR representations. So now let's do a small plausibility check on that. As I said, a three manifold with boundary is not really meant to be assigned a vector space. It's meant to be assigned an object in the category for its boundary. Now, Z, was assigned the space of automorphic forms. But you will see this is a representation of G of R. OK, maybe, uh, so, um, yeah, so, so notice this object is not just a vector space. It's a representation of G of R, so it lives in the category for its boundary, just as it should in this TQFT picture. Similarly, Z1 over P, this output, this space of automorphic forms, like that, is again, it comes with an action of G of QP times G of R, sorry. And uh, so, okay, so it, it meets this minimal plausibility check that it, uh, it lives in the correct habitat to be a, uh, to match with this TQFT thing. Okay, now in a moment what I would like to do is uh, talk about that gluing. Okay, the, uh, but, Let's just finish one thing here. Projective smooth curve over FP bar. So this has been discussed in G-Way's lectures. If you have a curve over the algebraic uh, um, closure of FP, you, it's, the function theory on the bundles doesn't really look very good. So this is, uh, you know, you're over an algebraically closed field. It has in, infinitely many points, even locally infinite. The, if you wrote down the definitions of Hecke operators, they would be infinite sums. It's very hard to make anything work. But as in Jiwei's talk, you can make things sort of robust to passing to the algebraic closure by passing to sheaves. Okay, and this is what one does in uh, the geometric Langlands program. You study rather than functions, which just you can't make any good theory of, you study the category of sheaves on G bundles. Okay, so as a so. Right above these G bundles were just a set, and we looked at functions here, here, the, below there, an algebraic variety. So there's something a bit funny here because, as I mentioned earlier, this jumbles a little bit local and global. Okay, I have here two local objects and one global one, but they're all two-dimensional and thus they are assigned categories. Similarly, above I have kind of three global objects, but also the ZP, which I'm about to talk about. Okay, so at least this uh, picture, as far as it goes, yeah, let's put this here for a moment. Is that going to look? Ah, it's a mess. That's not too bad. Okay, so the. the now the thing is, you know, this is a um, this is a fairy tale. That we don't have a big supply of things in number theory that look like bordisms or things uh, that are gluing. But for what we have, we can check that these definitions check out, that sort of um, work as they should. So let me do that for the one example we've discussed, which is going from Z to Z one over P. So remember that I said that uh, spec Z is obtained, this is just saying that thing about excising the tube in different language, by gluing 
spec ZP to spec Z1 over P along spec Q. Spec QP, sorry. Okay, so that was what I said last time. Um, spec ZP is the, the solid inside of the tube and spec QP is its boundary. So uh, the schematic picture of that is that, uh, you know, we have a, these are three-dimensional objects. So here's spec ZP, and this guy is QP, and this guy is Z1 over P. Okay, so now I want to, I want to check that uh, the appropriate gluing property holds. So remember what that gluing property is meant to be. Uh, yeah, for the purpose of this, let's, there is another boundary component in this picture, which is spec R, which I should have drawn, but let's ignore it because all the action here is going on along the other boundary component. So what is meant to happen is that, okay, these are two, this, this is three-dimensional, this is three-dimensional, and this boundary is two-dimensional. What we're meant to have is the space of, so this glued thing, okay, so this glued thing is kind of spec Z. All right, so if you see on this, uh, back here, the way it's meant to work is the homomorphisms from the left side to the right side are meant to recover the whole space. So hom in the category for the, where this is happening, that is inside the category of G of QP representations, from whatever it is that I assigned to ZP, and we didn't actually assign anything yet, to AZ1 over P is meant to recover a of Z, automorphic form for Z. Okay, that, that's what we would like to happen. That, that's uh, one instance in number theory which can be reasonably said to resemble that picture. Okay, now what are these things? The, this is this, uh, one way to think of them is that A sub Z is the space of adelic automorphic forms that are unramified at all finite places. And A sub Z1 over P is the space of adelic automorphic forms that are unramified at all places except P. Okay, so the relationship between them is as follows. A sub Z is equal to the, uh, the elements of A of A Z1 over P that are additionally unramified at P. That is, they are invariant by G of ZP. Okay. And so the question is just, is that, is that description of this form above? And it's easy to see it is. You can express it as, just by Frobenius reciprocity, as Homs from a, a representation will just take functions, compactly supported functions. I'm just saying Frobenius reciprocity here. G of QP mod G of ZP to A of Z1 over P. Okay, this thing below says exactly the same. All it says is A of Z are the things that A, Z over P unramified at P, but it's, it points out that it has the correct formal property to, uh, to fit into this gluing um, paradigm. Now, one point I want to make about this is that this, uh, th this equation encodes the Hecke operators at P. Hecke at P. So what I mean by that is, once you're given this presentation that AZ is homomorphisms from, from this to something else, automatically endomorphisms of this gadget here, I'm going to circle, okay, just because, as soon as you have this, just formally endomorphisms of this gadget act on AZ endomorphisms in the category of GQP representations. And that is, that's exactly the Hecke algebra. Okay, this should, these, these functions should be compactly supported. To be careful. So, the, so in other words, the, um, from this point of view, the Hecke algebra is not something that we're going to additionally build in. It's embedded inside the structure of how one thing is glued to another. Okay, that is to say, it's, it's part of the structure of this kind of arithmetic analog of a TQFT. Okay, so now let me, let me get rid of this big sheet. I don't think we need it anymore.
Okay, now, having said these things, so, Okay, so what have I said? I said the theory of automorphic forms has the general structure of a TQFT, meaning that the you know the various uh, kind of incarnations of it, the global, local, and, and geometric, all sort of fit together into the, uh, according to the same type of pattern. Now let's talk about the uh, what is the Langland's correspondence from this point of view. Okay, the Langland's correspondence is meant to be a, so uh, uh, it's meant to be a bijection between some kind of specific automorphic forms and Galois representations, and phrased that way, it does not fit very well in the story. So, so, so let, let's we're going to formulate what the Langland's correspondence is in. Uh, in this language. Okay, so let's just, um, let's imagine that we live uh, in the world, and hopefully some of you can bring this about, where we, re where we really have an analog of what a TQFT is in number theory. Okay, so let's tentatively call this, uh, this whole automorphic gadget, okay, so th where this is whatever, all, all these different arithmetic rings, that we've just discussed, and this is either a vector space or a category. Let's call this an arithmetic field theory. Okay, so, so the, the, uh, this is just a provisional term. Of course, you could go, you know, it wouldn't be hard just to mimic the definition, but the point is you have such a, uh, the supply of things like boardisms and gluing is so impoverished that the, it would be way too flabby. Okay, but let's suppose you could somehow find a good definition, and the model example would be the one we've just discussed, the theory of automorphic forms. Okay, now, so, okay, all right, let's talk about the Langland's correspondence. So, the simplest situation where we can discuss it is the, the situation of G ways talks, so it's kind of the cleanest, so let's do that. I'm gonna talk about, let's take X, a projective, smooth, curve over FP, and the usual uh, Langland's cost, and let's take the group GLN, okay? So the standard issue Langland's correspondence, which is proved here by Drinfeld for n equals two and Laforgue in general, is that the, there's a bijection between, let's say, cusp, cusp forms, cuspidal automorphic forms, and Galois representations. Now, what I have on that board over there, or here, is not individual automorphic forms, I have a vector space. Okay, so I'm just gonna take the linear span of this bijection. I'm just gonna extend it by linearity, which seems a little bit foolish, but let's do it. Uh, gives, so Drinfeld and Lefort give, an isomorphism of the, on the one hand, so we have the space of, let's say, cuspidal functions on n-dimensional vector bundles. This is your Adelic quotient here. Vector bundles on X. And yeah, I won't write it, but I should really say of compact support because the group has a center. Okay, I'm just taking the linear span, and, and what am I gonna put on the other side? Well, each, each eigenform goes to some Galois representation, so I'll just linearly extend that to the functions on Galois representations. So, uh, functions on uh, this set of n-dimensional irreducible Galois representations. Okay, and again, you have to be a bit careful about the center, so maybe I should put in some word like regular functions. But the, the, the point here is that I'm gonna take the usual, whatever the usual statement is, that, that's meant to be, uh, and I think of it as being, um, uh, I've just linearly extended it. So if I have 
the characteristic function of a single Galois representation over here, it's meant to go to the eigenform, but I, I just take the linear span. Now, of course, you've forgotten where in this left-hand space the, um, the cusp forms are, and you can remember it by keeping, so on this side here, we're going to say you have, for each point, you have the Hecke operator. And on this side here, you have, let's call it the Frobenius operator. So if I have a point on the curve, it gives you a specific function on Galois representations. Would you just take the Galois representation, take its trace of Frobenius at that point? So that's a specific function, and I can just multiply by that. This is just a multiplication operator on the space of functions. So the Langlands correspondence is equivalent to saying these vector spaces match compatibly with so where these endomorphisms are compatible with one another. This is, just, this is completely formal, but the point is this fits in much better with the framework that I've just said, because it just involves uh, vector spaces rather than individual functions. This, by the way, so a couple things. This is much more in the spirit of the way the geometric Langlands is um, formulated. And one thing you'll notice is that the two sides are fairly symmetric. Right? They both look like, I mean, there's some maybe different adjectives, but functions on some kind of n-dimensional vectorial data over the curve. And that, that's something which I think is, uh, has not been adequately exploited in number theory because the two sides feel much more different. But the two sides somehow have the, you see here, they have the same nature. They're described by very similar words with slightly different adjectives. So what does this suggest? Okay, so here you really have except for the technical details like the word cuspidal, this is the vector space that was associated to x. So let's put this here. So this suggests the following. This uh, suggests that we view um, the following viewpoint on the Langlands correspondence. That there is a there is a second arithmetic field theory which is built so that is to say this is a some by Jack here we have a isomorphism vector spaces that are attached to our uh, projective smooth curves and what I would like to say is that's a special case of some thing that, that some structure that exists at all tiers of our story. So there's a second arithmetic field theory, which is built out of built out of Galois representations into the dual group. Okay, so now this is this is going to be for me the Langlands. I'll put a check on top Langlands dual group. I really just, okay, I'm just dealing with split groups, so the standard dual group, no twisting. Um, let's call it, so I'm going to call the second theory B, G check. Okay, so sorry, I, I need to, yeah. So this is an arithmetic field theory, meaning that it assigns to, you know, you put in Z, you get out, uh, you know, you, you, you get a, a vector space, you put in QP, you should get a category, and so on. And an equivalence of arithmetic field theories, AG. So this means, or, this means the theory of automorphic forms, which we've already discussed you see on this slide over here, it does depend on G, so I'm putting that as a superscript. Okay. Now, so what is this meant to mean? It means that every input you put into it, you get the same answer, right? So you get isomorphisms of vector spaces, equivalences of categories, and all the structures are compatible on both sides. All right, so I already explained how the Hecke operators are implicit in this gluing structure. So that is not an extra uh, thing that is, I have to s say in addition. It's built in to asking this be an equivalence of arithmetic field theories. And we, you know, we have very reasonable, you know, in, in many other settings, we have reasonable candidates for this. For example, 
uh, in the the uh, um, in the two dimensional setting, it's often a category of coherent sheaves on spaces of Galois representations. So this is how we would view the Langlands correspondence from the point of view that we've been taking. Okay, it's, so this is like a, it's kind of local, global, and geometrics uh, packaged into one. Okay, but now, Yeah. So, um, a lot of the power of the theory of automorphic forms does not come from this abstract kind of bijection of automorphic forms and Galois representations. Okay, so this is usually what we regard as the central, this, it's, uh, this sort of bijection is, we often think of it as the, so, but it, in fact, a very large part of its utility comes from the fact that we are able to identify structures on either side that match with each other. Okay? That is, it's not just a naked bijection, but the fact that you can extract some numerical invariant on one side, which you can also identify on the other side. Okay, that's, uh, uh, okay and we have seen this, like, uh, we've had a, you know, this school on automorphic forms, but all, we've seen all manner of so numerical invariants that you can extract from an automorphic form, right? Fourier coefficients, Rankine-Selberg integrals, uh, uh, the doubling integral. You can see the theta correspondence in this way, uh, maybe a bit more confusingly. But and what is? Uh, what makes those constructions useful and important is very often they match with something on the Galois side, which is most often an L function. Okay, this piece of data is something external to the, it's not part of the core statement of the Langlands correspondence, but it's extremely important in number theory. Uh, if you look at applications of the theory of automorphic forms, like Sato Tate or the Artin conjecture or the Grossagi or applications analytic number theory, it all relies on the fact you have matching invariants. So there's a whole zoo of matching invariants Okay, and these are the these are like the uh, um, you know, special value for, for like, for example, so if E is an elliptic curve over Q, you know, all the cool formulas come out of this. Okay, so if E is an elliptic curve over Q, the value of its symmetric square L function at the edge of the critical strip. So I really want to, th I want to think of this as a Galois object. Okay, it's like the product over all primes. You can just write an explicit formula for it. It's like, I write this formula just to say this is really a Galois object. It's built up out of things, you, you know, counting points, traces of Frobenius, but it's equal to, up to a rational number, it's equal to a rational number, at, uh, pi times the area of the fundamental parallelogram of the elliptic curve. Okay, you take a, uh, so this is a, this, these sort of things are amazing formulas, and they, they are manifestations of this. One, this thing lives on the Galois side, this thing lives on the automorphic side, and uh, you know, good luck proving it without automorphic forms. So anyway, okay, so we would like to understand also, because this is actually an essential part of the, the theory of automorphic forms, um, where do these matching invariants come from? And again, we will, uh, we're gonna try to look for them we're going to try to think about this as something which exists in all peers simultaneously. So again, we will try to interpret it in terms of our TQFT. Okay, so firstly, where does this, where, where does a, where, 
So yeah, l l let me just, we have, we're, we're thinking about two things. We're thinking about a numerical invariant of automorphic forms and numerical invariants of Galois representations. Now, so, uh, yeah, so, l l so let's just say O is going to be a, a three-dimensional uh, ring coming from a ring of integers in a number field or a curve or a curve over fun or a curve over a function field. Okay, so where does a, num a numerical invariant of Galois representations, we have already encountered it in the talk. Okay, I wrote it down. It's as part of the Langlands bijection. Okay, in my bizarre formulation Langlands bijection, it was one side. So a numerical invariant of Galois representations, that is a way of assigning to each Galois representation a number of Galois representations is just belongs to uh, sorry B G J of uh, of O. This was the definition. Uh, this B thing, this other side of the language correspondence. I defined it to be something like functions on Galois representations. If we're looking for a numerical invariant of automorphic forms, where should that live? So again, this is meant to be something that assigns to every eigenform a number. So in other words, for every, uh, every element of a, every, I have a basis and a number for each element of that basis. So I can think of that as an element of the dual space. Because I'm dealing with space like L2, I'm not going to distinguish between the space and its dual. And I'll say this is so its numerical invariants live here. Okay, so just to be explicit, given, so this is just a, given an automorphic function P, we think of it as a, it gives the, you take any eigenform and you just take inner product with P. Okay, that's how it gives an invariant of each Hecke eigenform. Okay, so the, in other words, to find matching invariants, it means you want to find you want to find matching elements of this a uh, a o and b o. Okay, th that is the Langlands correspondence is saying there's a bijection in vector spaces. We want specific elements, a class of specific elements inside those vector spaces that uh, match for all inputs. Again, this notion, um, it's useful to try to find it at all levels at once. And it, it, has, it has also occurred inside um, the study of quantum field theory. OK, so I'm going to give you an informal definition. So uh, boundary condition. in a TQFT4, and I'm going to give you an informal definition. Um, this is, again, something that you can define rigorously, but I'll just say what we need for our purpose, is it's uh, a gadget that um, is a consistent assignment. All right, so to every three-manifold M, you should give a distinguished, you should distinguish a, a, a vector inside the corresponding vector space. And to each, and to each uh, surface, two manifold S, you should give a distinguished object inside the category. And if you in AS, OK, above AM is a vector space, below it's a category. A boundary condition, whatever you're given, it gives you something inside it. OK? So what we are looking for in, these langu in this language, and there's a very nice, for the physics uh, point of view, but uh, I think written for mathematicians, there's a very nice survey of this idea in Kapustin's 2010 ICM address. Um, which you can find. But so this, uh, the search for 
matching for new invariants of um, automorphic in Galois, which match amounts, we can ask more ambitiously for want matching boundary conditions in a G and B G check. Okay, so I, I'm, I know I must be about out of time, but it's my last slide. Okay, so then I'm, so I'll just, I will say one word about the work I've been doing. So, so in, um, I have a joint work with David Benz V and Yanis uh, Sakelaridis. In fact, I learned a lot of this from David Benzvi, and it was this work that I think um, convinced me personally that this is kind of a useful point of view. So in this work, we try to, I would say, develop this point of view, and I'll, I'll just summarize very informally what we say. Okay, so firstly, a G variety, a variety on which G acts, gives a boundary condition so our, our, our paper is an attempt to make these things precise and rigorous in some uh, setting. For AG and BG. So for suitable choice of Y, this recovers the, um, all the familiar um, Invariants of automorphic forms, you know, the, by which I mean all the uh, Rankine-Selberg type integrals, um, Fourier coefficients, state of correspondence, and so forth. And on the Galois side, uh, on the Galois side, it, it re recovers L functions. So this is this. And um, the last thing is we propose a specific class of dual pairs G Y and G check Y check with uh, which give rise to which give matching conjecturally give matching boundary conditions. So, what does this mean? It's some uh, attempt to uniformly understand all these zoo of um, matching invariants. And the most important thing it says is that the, the animals in the zoo come in pairs, uh, which is something I think new to number theory. So that, for example, each um, period integral should have a dual period integral. So, for, for example, the, the, uh, the um, Gangross-Prasad period is switched with the theta correspondence under this duality. Okay, so I wanted to mention that because that's really, I found the, this is a structure, you see, that lives in all tiers of the Langlands program at once, and those structures, I think this is a helpful point of, um, helpful point of view. But, okay, so let me just finish. You know, this is, um, this is a fairy tale. Uh, I, ha I have a friend who, when I say things like this, he looks at me and he says, "Well, it's good, but what can I buy with this? What, what can I buy with it at the supermarket?" <laughs> and he's a mathematician, but you know, even at a supermarket where theorems are legal tender, I don't think you can buy anything with this. Okay, so if you want to prove things about automorphic forms, you still have to go and you have to learn things in detail, and that's the only way to work with it. Um, but of course, you know, proving things is not our only goal. And I, this fact that the mathematical structure of automorphic forms is similar to the mathematical structures of topological quantum field theory, I think that's something very deep and uh, that, that we completely don't understand. Okay, that's really a challenge for the next generation of number theorists. And so that's why I gave this lecture um, 
devoted these lectures to this fairy tale. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. I will say with inflation these days, it's getting harder and harder to buy things at the supermarket. So, All right. Any uh, questions, Rakshi? Oh, yeah. Let's see one there. On. Got a bunch. Go that way. I'll go this way. Yeah, uh, recently, uh, there is this proposed uh, uh, Q deformation of quantum uh, local uh, long lens. And so I'm thinking, in your picture, do you see a way to incorporate this uh, right. deformation? It's a good question. I, I, I don't understand anything about it. So I, I think it's a very interesting thing. Uh, I, I don't know the arithmetic analog. It, it pr presumably has something to do with metaplectic groups. But that's all. I, I, I haven't thought about it enough to give you a good answer. It's an excellent question. Thank you. I'm, I'm back here, by the way. Um, so in the uh, arithmetic topology dictionary, a knot is uh, a prime is a knot. So one manifold um, is there a way to further further extend a TQFT downward yes. to one manifold yes, by attaching like a two category. There is, and uh, so this comes out of the study. Uh, um, this, uh, local geometric Langlands. So, so there is a, a two category that you can reasonably assign to that. Is it, is it e easy to say what that two category is, just out of curiosity? It's the, it'll be, uh, be comprised of categorical representations of some loop group. OK, thanks. Oh, hi. Um, could you, oh, let's see. Could you explain again um, the, uh, how you recover the Hecke algebra from the, uh, yeah. this is like about halfway through the talk. Yeah, how you recover the Hecke algebra from this like splitting of uh, the Z, Z into like the Z, Z Y. Yeah, all I meant to say is, so, the, uh, sorry, this is a very formal thing. Uh, it, it's um, sort of confusing for that reason. But if you have a space that's, you know, homs from A to B, you can always, uh, pre-compose that with a hom from A to A and get another element. So in this case, if you take homs from this guy to itself, in this category, you will get the Hecke algebra. So as soon as it's presented this way, you just for formal reasons get an action of it. Hey, so I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on why uh, for why X being a smooth projective over the finite field is a three-dimensional object versus X over yeah. the closure. Um, I mean, with the other things, there's, a, there's quite a bit of a difference between like the categories and functions, whereas here, we're just going between like function sheaf correspondence. I, I think the, the way to picture that is you think of FP as a circle. Sorry, who's asking the question? Could you raise your hand? Because I. Uh... Yeah, you think of FP as a circle, and so the projective smooth curve over FP is something like something um, a three manifold fibered over the circle whose fibers uh, are the analog of the curve over FP bar. Uh, and okay. That has very similar uh, features to the arithmetic story. Okay, nice. Okay, so there's this uh, work of Min Young Kim on these kind of arithmetic gauge theories or something like this. Are these kind of related to this picture in any way, or are these kind of two different fairy tales, so to speak? No, no, I think they're, they're related. Like, you know, like maybe part of the way to say it is at the very start, I'm motivated that uh, Z is like a um, manifold on the basis of topology. And really all that said was like a, a thing that has three-dimensional Poincare duality. But here, we, it seems much more like it behaves like a smooth manifold, and invariance of smooth manifolds can be, uh, are perhaps make sense. So I think it, it at least is worth the effort to think about other invariants like that. At a, also, at a detailed level, I, I think um, there may be some, uh, you know, there may be some relation, but I'm not sure. Uh, okay, so my question is basically that. So when, with the Langlands correspondence, we have automorphic forms, and then we have the separate object Galois representations that we're kind of attaching. Yeah. And we're, is there some, like, 
like class of or like some idea external to that of a TQFT and then like a Langlands correspondence there or so, sorry could you repeat the question I'm try and yeah so basically that like we have automorphic forms which are corresponding to TQFTs Langlands correspondence is giving us like a bijection a nice one between automorphic forms and Galois representations does that kind of translate at all in the fairy tale that like oh there are some objects in physics that you know are I think that correspondence, I, I was interpreting it as an equivalence of two TQFTs. Okay. Yeah. Well, automorphic forms are elements of a specific vector space that comes out of the TQFT. But the whole theory of automorphic form for G is one TQFT, and, and there's a whole theory for the Galois representations, and then those whole things are meant to be equal. And all, all the data, all the compatibilities match up. Okay. Oh, could I, um, it seems that your arithmetic field theories don't attach anything to objects of dimension five and higher. So that, should we expect to have anything which attaches something interesting to, say, curves or rings of integers? Or is that not in this picture? Uh, I, I don't know the answer. It, it's, it's, it's certainly worth thinking about. Like, it's a, yeah, I, I think it's certainly worth thinking about. I, I don't know if it, I, I just don't know. I have a question. Um, so, does this framework also uh, can this framework also incorporate information about uh, non-cuspidal automorphic forms like Eisenstein series? Uh, 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 yes. So, you, uh, as you've noticed, I've been extremely sloppy. But, but the closest to, to realizing this, um, the geometric Langlands is already, I, I would say, formulated in a way close to this. And there, at, at least uh, conjecturally, it it's satisfactorily accounts for the whole spectrum. So I wrote Cuspidal just to try to make uh, um, accurate statements. But absolutely, I, I think it would be very disappointing if it did not. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm over here. So. Um, there's this work of Stolz and Teichner on associating to TQFTs um, various different types of cohomology theories, in particular K-theory and elliptic cohomology theories are associated to, you know, the uh, one genus case. There is also this work where there are um, collections, uh, like collections of smooth structures on spheres are associated to numerators of Bernoulli numbers and the image of J in homotopy theory is associated to denominators of Bernoulli numbers. And so far, all of these things have been found kind of by accident or by computing both and showing them that they're the same. Do you think that somehow this connection between uh, these two equivalent TQFTs could possibly also lead over into um, various different cohomology theories associated to formal group laws and the associated TQFTs to those? I don't know of any connection, but that's also I don't I don't think I know a lot about the things you said, so they well might I, I just don't know. Okay, let's make this our let's have a your last question here. Um, in in your last slide, there's this thing, this G variety Y. Yeah. Uh, what role does this play in in the in, in what what we've seen, for example, in this uh, series? Yeah. So so uh, the, the the way and this uh, instead. Uh, so I'll give the simplest example. You know, uh, things like the many of the you can think of many of these um, rankin solberg type integrals, essentially integrating an automorphic form over a subgroup. Okay. Or maybe you take the product with, but integrating an over a subgroup. And in this picture, that you index that by this. If you integrate, it, rather than, sorry, the uh, period of integrating over a subgroup is indexed by the G variety G mod H. So if I were to say this, uh, I said informal, um, what we actually have are um, symplectic varieties with a G action, and then it, it, it's their uh, quantization, which gives rise to a function that you can pair with. That, that would be a more accurate statement of the philosophy. Okay. 
Uh, well, let's thank Akshay again. And <clears throat> so this completes our main program. So let's thank um, all of our speakers. And oh, hold on. All right. So being, there's the last speaker. You have two duties. One is to finish on time. I failed at that one. <laughs> The other one is to thank the organizers of the conference. So, you know, I've organized conferences 20